It's rare for a completed work to be improved by revision. Johannes Brahms. Felix Mendelssohn's Symphony No. 4, known popularly as the Italian Symphony, has been a staple of the orchestral repertoire for more than 150 years. Its lively dance rhythms, flowing melodies, and brilliant poetic orchestration have made it beloved by musicians and audiences alike. And yet this work, which appears to be another compelling manifestation of the dazzling Mozartian facility we associate with Mendelssohn and his music, has a surprisingly troubled compositional history. He described the symphony as the cause of some of the most bitter frustrations of his career. He was so dissatisfied with his repeated attempts to revise it that when he died in 1847, the piece was still unpublished. Like every major composer of the early Romantic period, Mendelssohn struggled with the task of assimilating the legacy Beethoven had left in the symphonic realm. Born in 1809 and raised in a family environment that emphasized education and scholarship, he was in many respects a classicist. The revival of Bach's music he initiated with a legendary performance of the St. Matthew Passion in 1829 is indicative of his veneration for the music of the past. In contrast to Beethoven, the notion of investing in abstract instrumental compositions such as a symphony with an implicit extra-musical meaning that transcended its simple aesthetic value was contrary to Mendelssohn's artistic inclinations. Thus, for all his brilliance, his symphonic output was limited and uneven. He only wrote five symphonies, only three of which, numbers three, four, and five, are still performed with any regularity. <laughs> Mendelssohn's Italian Symphony was conceived as a musical postcard that would reflect his impressions of Italy while traveling through the country during a youthful grand tour of Europe undertaken between 1829 and 31. Completed and premiered in 1833, the original version of the symphony is filled with vivid evocations of the Italian peninsula, such as the energetic dance rhythms of native folk music, the ritualistic solemnity of the church, and the lyricism that has characterized the country's music since ancient times. In spite of the symphony's popularity when it was first performed, Mendelssohn was dissatisfied with it and soon began a process of revision that was incomplete when he died. While he's known to have worked on the piece in 1837 and then again in 1841, it is his 1834 revision of the second, third, and fourth movements that most fully documents his strangely misguided attitude to the piece. What has survived of these musical second thoughts is stunning within the context of our vision of Mendelssohn as an artist of limitless facility and faultless taste. Although he made no large-scale changes, the 1834 revision includes dozens of small alterations of harmony, phrase length, and melodic contour that at best add little to the work's attractiveness and at worst robs phrases of their original color and naturalness. The first movement escaped unscathed simply because Mendelssohn's oft-stated intentions to completely revise it never came to fruition. In considering why Mendelssohn would feel compelled to engage in such a futile, even destructive enterprise, a closer look at the complexities of his personality can be useful. Although the traditional portrait of the composer as a gentleman of infinite civility and grace is rooted in reality, it is only a partial representation of Mendelssohn's inner life. The neurological wiring that produced musical works of gleaming perfection was also particularly sensitive. Mendelssohn was excitable, easily annoyed, prone to irritability, and given to fits of rage. He possessed a notable capacity for kindness and generosity in his relationships with family and friends, but he had a tendency to fall into dark moods when placed outside his various zones of comfort. If something was amiss, simply overlooking it was all but impossible. The following description of a coach journey Mendelssohn's friend Ferdinand Hiller shared with the composer in the mid-1830s reveals that this stubborn intolerance could sometimes yield comical results. The coachman did or said something stupid, upon which Mendelssohn jumped out of the carriage in a towering rage, hurling a torrent of abuse upon the man and declaring that nothing would make him get into the coach again. But of course, we were the ones who were to be punished, as we had to walk the entire way home. Later at supper, Felix himself couldn't help laughing heartily about it, and yet he still stoutly maintained that he was right.
Although Mendelssohn's death in November of 1847 was widely mourned as premature, it was in fact unsurprising. He died of a stroke, as had his sister Fanny, his father, and his grandfather. The combination of his intrinsic intensity and an acute awareness that death could come without warning had likely fueled a propensity for overwork that eventually broke his health, leaving him exhausted and vulnerable at the end of his life. When the remaining family members gathered to dispose of Mendelssohn's estate, the question of what to do with the still unpublished Fourth Symphony arose. The heirs decided to have the original version published. It was the only version that had reached a definitive, holistic stage of completeness, and Fanny Mendelssohn, whose musical judgments her brother had always trusted implicitly, strongly preferred this initial iteration of the work. We can be grateful that their decision to preserve the Fourth Symphony in the form that most closely reflects the inspiration and imagination that brought it into the world has bequeathed to us one of Mendelssohn's most colorful and engaging works. Mm -hmm.